I'm in London together with Tom Nom Nom and we just finished a great hacking event. It's time for some educational fun stuff. Absolutely, man. Like, we've just been hacking on Uber. Yes, so I thought what we might do is like just show how I might approach doing a little bit of recon on a target uh -huh. with Bash and with Linux and all that kind of thing. Cool. So I've got myself an empty directory. Yep. Um, and like the first thing you want to do is like some kind of subdomain enumeration uh -huh. and there's like a whole bunch of tools around uh, I'm just gonna use one that I hacked together a while ago uh, that I called asset finder. It's in my github repos. Sweet. Uh, and you built this one. Yeah, it's super simple. It's just like fetches from passive uh, resources. It doesn't do any actual brute forcing. Okay. I'm just gonna use it because it's quite fast. Cool. Uh, so like let's have a look at Uber, right? Yeah. Um, so if I run this, I'm going to get like fairly quickly a, a, like a reasonably big list, and I want to store this in a file. Uh, and I'm going to do this with this, this angle bracket character here. Yeah. So basically what that means is I want to take the output of that command and put it into a file. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to put it into a file called domains. Yeah. Uh, so if I do an ls now, you can see I've got a file called domains. Sweet. And I can run cat on that and I'll put it just right there, okay? Cool. Um, now, not all of these are gonna have like HTTP servers running on them. No. So I wanna like do a pre-filter and go and find uh, which ones of those do. So I'm gonna take my domains. Uh, I'm gonna use this character here, the pipe. Yep. Um, and what that means is like take the output of this command and put it into the input of the next command, right? Oh, that I'm gonna run now. So I have another tool called HTTP probe. Okay. Um, which takes uh, domains on its input and checks if there's an HTTP or an HTTPS server listening. And if there is, it outputs it. So you're taking all the all the domains or all the lines that you got in this domains file and you're sending them straight over the HTTP probe. Exactly, man. Could you do the same thing with what web? Uh, yeah, probably, man. I don't really use what web, but okay. uh, I, I think probably. And if not, there's ways around it. You can. Uh, you can do anything in Bash, man. Sweet. Uh, so uh, I want to store the output of this in a file, but I kind of want to see the output as it's happening as well. So oh. Keep an eye on it. So I could use that angle bracket thing like we used earlier. Then but you do another file, right? You can also use uh, the T command, Ooh. which like T like a split, right? It takes one stream of input and splits it into two. So one half goes to a file and the other half goes to your screen. Ooh. So I'm gonna make this in a file called hosts and we can see the output happening now. Uh, so these are all the HTTP and HTTPS servers it's found. Oh, um, so it's actually sending a request out now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for port 80 and port 3, see if it's answering. Exactly that, man. It, exactly it, that. It, it doesn't care what it answers, it just sees yeah. it open or not. Yeah, is it listening? Yeah. Uh, and if it is, it prints it to the screen. Cool. And because we've piped this into T, it's going to get stored in a file too, mm. which is awesome because that means I can like reuse it for stuff. That's perfect. I never use T. I always go back and have to look at my file afterwards. Yeah, like... And I do and I do the double one in four ways, and I'm continuously writing to the same file and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I've done that a lot. So you can do T-A to append, which yeah. is like the double arrow. Yeah. Um, I like it because... T-A? Yeah. Nice. A for append, man. Yeah. So I really like that because um, sometimes uh, I have this thing where I'll do like the angle bracket yeah. and I'll leave the command running. Yeah. I come back an hour later and like it wasn't running the whole time. Like. It was just hung, yeah. and nothing's been written to the file. No. Right? But with T, like I get to see the output. And it looks cool on your screen too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like I get to see it scrolling past and yeah. like nice and fast. You can have a look at that file. Um, we can see we've got uh, 341 hosts to, to look at. How did you quit your whim so fast? <laughs> just typing fast. Literally, there was no shortcut. It was just uh, Q all bang. What I want to do now is go and, like, I know that there's these HTTP servers listening, right? Yeah. I want to see, like, what's there um, and just have, like, a poke around. I'm not looking for anything specific. I just want to know, like, what's running on these systems. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to use a tool called Meg. Okay. Um, it's another one of mine. I have a lot of like tools up on my GitHub profile that I built for this kind of thing. Um, and it's pretty good at going and fetching one path for like lots of hosts. Okay. So if we look at its help output, um, quite a bit here. 
but we can see you get lots of options, like what your concurrency level is, so it can do lots of requests concurrently. Uh -huh. um, if you've got multiple CPUs, that'll be in parallel. Um, and one of the really important things here is you can tune the delay uh, between requests to the same host. So sometimes I might say, like, I only want to hit uh, each host once every minute or okay. something like that. So it, you get control over that. And you can set a bunch of other things as well. Uh, so let's do that. So I just want to look for like slash, which is just the root directory. Yep. Um, and I want the delay to be, what did we say, one second or something like that. Uh -huh. uh, and let's go verbose mode as well. So we can see it. Yeah, so we can see what's going on. Um, and like off it goes, it's going to run a whole lot of stuff. It's making a request to all of these and it's saving its output. We've got the concurrency at the default levels, which is like 20. It can run way faster uh, if you wow. want it to. But it seemed really, really fast. Yeah, it's definitely not the fastest out there. Um, so uh, James Kettle, uh, Albino X, has an amazing tool uh, as part of that called Turbo Intruder. Yeah. If you're looking at lots of things on one host, it's so fast. Yeah. So, uh, but this is kind of almost deliberately slow in, in a lot of ways, yeah. but still, it kind of works out okay. And what did we get? So, I've got this directory called output. Cool. Uh, so, I'll cd, I'll change directory into there. And in here is one folder for each of the hosts that we looked at. Okay. Uh, and if we pick on, say, like <laughs> this, oh my log or something, yeah. there's two files in there. Okay. Um, and each one of them is, one of them will be the HTTP and one will be the HTTPS. Okay. Uh, there's an index file in here uh, that includes like all of the file names that we Ooh. had and the hosts and things and yes. what the response code was. Cool. But um, so you can easily grab that this to find which are 200 or which are 302ing you and all that stuff. So you can know map your attack surface even more. Yeah, for sure. So when we've been hacking on Uber, right? We've been uh, we know that they have stuff that's on uberinternal.com. Right? Yeah. We know that like from their program page, it's in scope. Um, so I might want to look for Uber internal in all of these files. But, uh, no. Like if I could type, that would be super useful. Um, <laughs> so uh, I kind of oh, use these flags all the time without really thinking about it. The H isn't actually even really needed, but uh, that means display the file name in the yep. output. N is uh, display the line number. R is recursive, so it goes into all of these directories, and I is case insensitive, so if okay, so it shows up with like a capital U, it's still gonna. So we got quite a few results out of this, and they all look kind of similar, mm -hmm. and they're spread across lots of lines. Yep. So because like this isn't the best environment to uh, really review this output, one of the things I tend to do is I'll pipe things, you remember the pipe, into Vim. Yep. So Vim space dash tells them, I want you to take the input you've been given from the pipe yeah. and open that in a buffer like this. Ooh. So now I can kind of see uh, all of the different places that uberinternal.com has shown up. And I know I've got uh, 34 results. Oh, so you, you're parsing the information over, getting it into like a Vim buffer yeah, and then you're able to play around with it. And if you want to save it, you'll easily save it somewhere, and you can continue to search yeah, so here, I can, right? I can just save this as a file called results, uh, colon W, and results. Yeah. So this and is how would you file. search in here? This in so in, in Vim, I can just hit forward slash and yeah. say like, uh, take me to the Uber internal parts and just oh. kind of highlight and it highlights them for you. And I could hit N and go through here. But one of the real common things I face um, when looking at this kind of stuff is like, there's a lot of stuff in here that's clearly like it's pretty boring. I don't care about it. No. There's a lot of this content security policy stuff. But one of the nice things I can do with Vim is I can take the current file, which is represented by percent, okay. um, and, a, and a bang, which means run this through a shell command. It's like piping this content, this data, into a process and then back into Vim. No way. So firstly, I can sort this. Um, and then the other thing I can do is say, well, actually, I don't want all of these content security things, right? Yeah. So, so they are, oh, so they're at, you are, Okay, so he's taking the command, doing this, sending it back into Vim, doing it again, sending it back into Vim. So yeah. you, you just curate the output right now. Yeah, absolutely. So Ooh, that's nice. So when you have like 10,000 lines or something, yeah. you're like, I don't want to look at all these manually. Yep. The, like, that's a real nice way to work because sometimes Dude. it's 
hard nice. to find exactly the thing you want. Yeah. But it's pretty easy to find lots of things and then pull stuff out that you don't want. Yeah. And it's super fast too because like the stuff that's in Vim might have taken a long time to search through. You yeah. search through like a gigabyte of stuff. Um, just using the percent in the bang. Yeah. You're there. Um, but like once it's in here, I can reprocess it really quickly. So we have like these CSP things as well. Like I don't want those, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do VI for so V is invert, the V invert, yeah, uh, which means like remove uh, okay. and the I case insensitive, and I'm going to pull out those CSP ones as well. So you watch them go. There they are. So I'll often go graphing for lots of different things. So I have surprise, surprise, another tool uh, <laughs> called GF, which is short for grep for. Uh, and what this does is it takes files which are stored in your home directory in .gf, uh -huh. JSON files, um, and they contain patterns. Uh, these are patterns that are passed to grep. And okay. really, this whole tool is just a wrapper around grep. I can't remember this whole thing. Uh, I, I can't type this out every time I want to use it. So I have it stored in here, and I can just run GF AWS keys. And if there was any here, it would find them. Yep. So I have a whole bunch of those. Uh, for finding things like S3 buckets, for example, or <laughs> there's none here. Let's find something it is here. So uh, base64, right? So if we have a look you at found that everything inside the, the, the information that you got down, you say in GF and your predefined like almost like looks like regex to me. Yeah, this is this absolutely that's what it is. It's a regular expression for grep. Yeah. So uh, the format of these files is we give it the flags that we would have given to grep. Yeah. Like we can run this exact thing uh, and get exactly the same output. Uh, just by like copy and pasting it. Uh, so like the output's the same, but like who wants to type this, right? Um, you see EYJ, that's a base64 encoded JSON string, like the start off. So if we make one like this uh, and pass it into uh, base64, like we see the output starts at EYJ, right? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's it, it's the curly brace and the quote. Base 64 encoded. It always looks the same. Yeah, and I have a bunch of these which are prefixes for things like uh, serialized PHP values, uh, serialized Java values, uh, XML. This one is. These are HTTPS and HTTP for URLs. Sometimes you see Base 64 encoded URLs. Yep. And a few others. So like we've got these Base 64 encoded things, and like I don't know what these are. Right. No. I can't read. Base 64. So, like, let's do kind of the same trick we did before and yep. put them into Vim. And I want just the Base 64 encoded parts because I want to do something with them. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to use my percent bang trick again, and I'm yep. going to pass into a thing called awk, Yep. Which is a text processing uh, command. Really, it's a whole language. Okay. Um, and I'm going to tell awk that I want my field separator to be the colon, um, and that I want to print the third field. So that would be versus, the same, same thing as cut minus D. Yeah, you can do it with cut too. Um, oh, yeah. For whatever reason, orc uh, handles different kinds of white space a little better than cut does. So sometimes you use cut and you find it doesn't work because you said you just separate as a space. Yeah. And actually there's a tab and it just didn't work. Ah. Orc kind of handles that situation a little bit better. So if we run this, we get just that base64 nice. encoded things. But now we need to remove some characters in the beginning. Yeah, so um, when I have stuff like this in Vim, like I could just like manually delete all of them. Uh, but if I hit Control V, that puts me in visual block mode. Yeah. And I can do vertical selections too. Oh, nice. And then I hit X and they get deleted, right? So how would you do it if you ended up with getting a, let's see, we want to remove all the nines here on the end. All Usually the you'll, you'll end up with a dot on the end when you get a DNS file. And you okay, wanna... should we put some dots on the end? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I have a couple of options here. So like the sort of easy but slightly more tedious way is I would hit uh, shift A which is append yeah. and then backspace and then egg, and then escape that's yeah. one line but a nice thing about vim is if you hit dot it repeats the last thing you did yeah so if i hit down and then dot that dot's gone mm -hmm. and then i can just alternate between those two and then they're gone right so that's cool. one option uh, the other option is I can search for something uh, like a 
dot that's at the end of the line. So a dollar means end of the line. Okay. Um, and in Vim, you can do a search and replace. And if you don't um, put in the search part, which would be here, this would be the search part. Yeah, anything between yeah. slashes, right? Uh, if you don't put one of those in, it uses whatever the last thing you searched for was. Um, and because I want to replace it with nothing, I just put another slash in, and then they're all gone too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Epic, that was super nice. Cool. So we've got a few of these base64 encoded strings. We want to know what they are. Uh, so, but there's some duplicates, right? Yeah. So I'm going to fashion it as sort dash u with the yep. percent bang trick. And then not only are they sorted, but the duplicates are gone. Yep. We don't care about those. Um, and now we want to know what they are. So we kind of know that we could take one of these things, um, and if I just run sh in the column thing, it'll put me back in a shell temporarily. OK. So, so now you put that on hold. It's just, yeah. It's Vim's strange. still running in the background, and, and when I exit this shell again, it'll come back up. Yeah. Um, so I know that if I echo this into base 64-D, uh, it will give me the decoded version. OK? Yeah. Um, and I want to do that for all of these lines. And here we only have four, but you know, you might have 400. Yeah. And you don't want to do that manually. No. So, uh, percent bang again is coming back. Um, and we're going to pass all of these into a tool called Xargs. Okay. Now, Xargs. I've seen Xargs. I never really understand what it does. Okay. So, Xargs takes um, multiple lines of input that you give it with a pipe, okay. for example, and it will run a command for every line of input. Oh. Um, and it's a little bit tunable. There's a lot of options to it. But by default, it would give all four of these to just one command, all in one go. Yep. You don't want that. So we do N1. One at a time. Yeah, one at a time. Uh, I, I don't know what the I stands for, like what it's short for, uh, but what this means here is um, I'm going to use this bracket sequence, open bracket, close bracket. It's like a placeholder to mean that line of data. Um, and I'm just telling XRX that's the pattern I'm going to use for that. Um, and I'm going to run uh, the shell, the SH shell, uh, with a command. And in there, I'm going to echo whatever that line is into base 64-D, like, just like we did on the command line a second ago. Yeah. And because we're doing a percent bang, that's going to come straight back into our Vim buffer. Ready? Ooh. There it is. So no way. These are the base <laughs> 64 decoded versions of, um, of those strings that we put in. You know how many hours I spent <laughs> on doing that manually. So like we can see that these are all like fairly boring in this case, but I, think I have one more nice example of uh, what I can do with all of these files because there's still a lot of them. Yeah. Um, do you so, ever screenshot them? Uh, sometimes, uh, but I spent a long time with a really slow internet connection. Oh. So I kind of got used to doing everything on a VPS. Yeah. Um, in I used DigitalOcean, um, uh, and I want to do everything over SSH because, yeah. like, remote desktop on Linux. Uh, no, I I, I want to do it in the terminal mm -hmm. on my nice fast VPS. So. Um, well, I do have like an alternative to screenshotting, which is kind of it's the low tech version of screenshotting. Mm -hmm. So, what I might do is say like I've got all of these files, uh -huh. uh, so I'm using find to to find them all and say give me just things that are type file. Um, and I have uh, another tool called HTML tool. Um, and what HTML do tool does is you give it a list of files, uh, and then you can have it parse things out of the HTML. So if I was looking for all of the JavaScript files, yeah. for example, um, if I just have a look at the help output, oh, there isn't one. <laughs> uh, I think it's a trib, SRC? No, a tribs, SRC? Something like that? Yeah, Woo. there we go. So th this is all of the values of all of the source attributes in all of those files. All right, and this is all of the, like, for some of them it's gonna be images, and some of it's going to be JavaScript files because, like, the image tag has an SRC attribute, so does the script tag, right? Okay. Um, and, like, we can fix that pretty easy and just say, I want just things that end in .js with 
grep and like now we've got just these are all the javascript files from all those html files and so, i can look through and see do any of these look interesting and i can do the same thing i did with vim before and put them in there and refilter them and change them and stuff cool um but the other thing html tool can do uh, is give you the contents of tags so here i'm going to look at uh all of the title tags and i'm going to put these into a vim buffer so there's a lot that are going to be the same, like 301 move permanently and all that kind of thing. So let's sort. So dash u for unique. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So these are the 23 unique titles that were in those uh, 100 and something or 279 different ones. Which is amazing. But how do you know which site was used where this Uber self-driving is? That's a, that's a good question. So. Uh, one of the things I can do here is uh, I have a Vim shortcut set up for this, mm -hmm. um, which I have set to leader G, which does a grep for whatever's under the cursor and then opens the results in a new buffer, in a new tab. Um, so it shows up in a few places by the looks of things, but this selfdriving.uber.com looks to be the most Apparently interesting the one. one. Uh, so I can hit Control W, then G, uh, Shift F, uh, and, and it's going to show me, uh, it's take me straight to the line, line 25, where that Uber self-driving thing shows up, right? Dude, that's epic! Um, and I can just, if I add a line wrap here, we can kind of see all, all of the rest of the stuff that shows up. Um, Classy. No wonder you were able to grip through the whole GitHub repo in <laughs> seconds. <laughs> yeah. Um, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you do this with all GitHub repos that you stumbled upon? Or, uh, or? So for the GitHub repo, like, yeah, something really similar. The it was the other week. one liner? <laughs> yeah, that, that, the other that week. Just blew I, me away. <laughs> this thing, right? Yeah. So um, I tweeted this uh, a, a couple of weeks back. Uh, and then, like a few hours later, I used it to, yeah. to find something pretty bad that we can't talk about. Full, fully redacted. Yeah, uh, like this is a mess, right? It's all in one line. Um, it's not easy to figure out what this thing does. So we can go and like see uh, what this does yeah. as, as an example, and then maybe we can like pull it apart and explain all the parts. Of it. Cool. I'm gonna hop into one of my repositories. It's not a security-related thing. It's just a, another tool that I wrote. I know I've said that a lot. Uh, this one you is. You write great tools. Thanks, man. So this isn't a security tool. This is a tool called Gron. Um, uh, and what this one does is take a JSON file or some JSON data like this mm -hmm. um, and turns it into a series of JavaScript assignments. Okay. So the reason for that is that I can uh, then grep for stuff. That's the G in Gron is, is grep. It's okay. like a portman portmanteau, portmanteau of grep and JSON. Uh, so I can take like just the likes lines from this and I can um, see the full path to them, right? Yeah, and see what you're doing here. Yeah, and then I can do the reverse too and like turn that back into JSON again with just that part. Um, okay, so this is the repo we're going to use. Um, so this is the thing that I kind of uh, tweeted. Yep. Um, and what it does is it takes all of the Git object files and history and everything that's ever been in a Git repo and outputs it all as one text stream so that you can run it through Grab. Um, and uh, so uh, for an example, I might want to find all of the times that I made a Go function or something like that. And there's probably going to be a lot of results here. Here we go. Here they are, like every single one that's, that's ever happened in this repo. Ever happened? Yeah, ever. So when you have a Git repo, uh, there's this .git folder. Yeah. And in there is a folder called objects. And those objects are every version of every file that there ever has been. Yeah. So a commit itself is actually um, a thing called a, is one of those objects, right? Yeah. Um, and it has a pointer to a thing called a tree, which is another object, which has a pointer to other things like blobs and other trees, which are just objects again, right? So like my license file here. Um, it is just another object with my license in it, which is apparently from 2016. Okay, so instead of just going for the file name, you're going for for the identifier. Yeah, absolutely. From that time, 
uh, yeah. history. So note that like when I looked at this commit, um, it pointed to a particular tree. Yeah. That tree describes the state of my repository at the time that that would commit happened. Okay. okay. Um, so we can, in theory, travel back in time and yeah. find keys that have been published and then removed. Yeah, so the object file stays. That's how you can, like, go back in time. So if I do git checkout uh, master and then uh, this three carats means three commits before master, it's going to take me back in time. Uh, and the reason it does that so fast is the files never went anywhere. They're still in that objects directory, right? Yeah. Um, I can go back to master with a dash. Um, so let's have a look at that command. Sure. Um, and, and we'll reformat it uh, and like make it a bit more readable. And yep. hopefully we can make some sense of it. Uh, so I'm going to call this something like uh, gh dump git history dump dot sh. Yep. Um, and the first thing we need here is a thing called a shebang, which is a hash and a bang and slash bin slash bash. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually an indicator to the kernel that this is a shell file that needs to be interpreted by the bash interpreter. Yes. So, and if we're not having it in there, it would not execute, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm going to take the grep off this uh, part mm -hmm. um, because it's, we don't kind of don't need it. Uh, and we end up with this great big long thing. So let's add some line breaks in here to kind of make things a, a, a little bit easier to read. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing we have here is a find in .git, .git object pack for file names that uh, end with .idx. Yeah. So after a while, you end up with a lot of object files in Git and like too many, right? So as an optimization, yep. Git will pack all of those together into one file called a pack file, like all squished together, yep. so it gets better compression. Oh yeah, for sure. And um, it needs to know where they are in that pack file, so it has these .idx files that explain, like uh, stores, like what the offset is in that pack file. Right? So um, we find all of the index files, and we pipe them into while read i. And, and, and what that does is take each index file name and put in a variable called i. Yeah. And then we run a command with it. We say I want to do this command, git show index, and um, pass it the There's file name. There's an i there. I there. And this left-hand angle bracket means take the file on the right and attach it to the input of this command. Take the file to the right? Or to the left, sorry. Okay. The, the left, this left stand here. Okay. So, yeah, it takes the file on the right and like attaches it to the input of the, okay. this git show index command. So that show index command outputs three columns of data. Um, and we want the second one. So we use awk to do that. And then we're kind of done for that. That gives us all of the object uh, hashes that have been packed. Okay. Then we want to find all the objects that haven't been packed. So we do a find dot get so objects we type on, Are we restarting the process now? In a yeah, way? absolutely. That's exactly what we're doing. Pulling out the pack files because we've already dealt with those. Yeah. So we were minus v. Yeah. Means right. we are we are ignoring those. Absolutely. We are using awk to. But now uh, we now we've got a capital F here in awk. Yeah. So this is the field separator. Oh yeah yeah. So. Let me pull up another terminal real quick. So if I run find dot get objects, um, this is the the output that I get. And we've got type f as well, which is just files. So at the moment we see directories, now it's just files. And this is the bit that we want. The first two characters have been split. And somewhere in here, um, there are some pack files too. Here we go, there's one right here. We don't want that one. So that's the grep-v yep. slash pack. Do not want that. But what we do want is this with the uh, slash removed. This is the last two parts of this path if you separate them by a slash. Yeah. So we use awk with a field separator of slash. Yes. And then we tell it we want to print uh, the <laughs> number of fields minus one, which is the second to last field. And so that's where NF number comes of fields. In, right? Number of fields is the last field. So that will give us all of those object hashes. So that's what this is doing. So we take those two commands, uh, and these are wrapped in curly braces here, right? Yeah. And those curly braces mean take these two separate commands 
and combine their output so we can put them into something else. Yes. And we put them into a while read O, and that means take each line of input, put it into a variable called O, and then we can use it somewhere else. And then so all the data that we collected from these two sets, we take all the information that we found in our read I, yep. we grabbed all that, and we excluded all the pack information, and we sorted out all the information that we found, now we're ready to do something with it. Yeah. This is just running in memory now. Yeah, absolutely. So what we do with all those object hashes is we pass them to git cat file. So yeah. you saw we used that earlier on when yes. we were looking at the uh, raw objects for the yep. commits and things. Um, and that outputs all of the text that's in that object. So <laughs> with a bit of luck, we can make this file executable with chmod or change mode, change the file mode, yeah. to add and execute it for this GH DOM. And if we run it, we should get an output that is all of the files, all of the objects that there's ever been in this repository. Beautiful, um, beautiful. And then we can grab it, right? So before I grabbed for all of the functions that we had. Yep. Um, but we've got a little bit of a, an issue here where we've got this line binary file standard input matches. Yeah. Uh, and what this means is grep thinks that we've given it a binary file, which we totally have because there was probably an image in there or something. Ah, but at the point that it hits sure, some sure. non, uh, like non ASCII bytes, like some null bytes probably, um, it decided, oh, this is a binary file. I'm going to stop outputting stuff. I'm just going to stop what I'm doing. So you'd break. Yeah, absolutely. And I might be missing some information because of this. Right. But grep-a stops that from happening. So, so now what you might have seen we had more output. Yeah, absolutely. So if we look at the man page for grep uh, and find the dash a option, yep. we can see it says process a binary file as if it were text. This is equivalent to dash dash binary dash files equals text option. Um, or we can use dash dash text too. Ooh. Uh, and that's the real difference there, is that without the A, if I use WC or the word count function, I can see I get 162 results. Yep. Um, but then with the dash A, because it stopped, oh, with the dash A, I get oh, 1,859 results. Right? That's easy to miss. Super yeah, easy to miss. For sure. So like, if I was grepping for like AWS keys, yeah. I would have maybe missed them, right? yeah. um, or if there was important URLs. So one of my favorite patterns I have for GF is the URLs pattern, mm. um, which just finds every URL that's in there. And then I can go and grab for like whatever my target is. And there's going to be a lot in here, right? Like, and a lot we don't care about, like Facebook and CloudFront and stuff. Yep. And there may be like a little bit funny, like these have got semicolons on the end. Um, but as a first pass, I might grep for, say, Uber to yeah. find just the Uber URLs. Yeah. Um, and there's quite a few in here. Um, a lot of them are going to be boring. There's going to be duplicates and that kind of thing. So let's pipe them into BIM so we can play with them. So the first, whim. first thing we're going to do is sort them yep. uh, by unique. We've got 700 of them. And there's going to be duplicate paths between these things. So I'm going to use another tool um, called unfurl. That's another one of mine. And one of the things unfurl can do is say, give me the unique paths, for example. Yeah. So these are all of the unique paths that were in so those we're through all of them, yeah. check which of these are unique. So we're not getting our duplicates, and more or less what we just did was to create the word list. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And this is a word list for like paths. Yeah. Um, but if we go back to where we were, uh, we might want to have a look for query string parameters, right? Yeah. And Unfurl supports that too. Oh. Um, so I think it's called keys, dash u keys. So these are all the unique query string parameters that were in there. Ooh. So if you use uh, the param miner extension, for example, yeah. You'll this would be yeah. your, your, your personal word list. This would be a great source of, um, of, of ID, the IDs for that. Um, and if you're just looking for URLs, generally uh, things with way back URLs, right? Yeah. Uh, which is another tool. Um, which is insanely good. Yeah, it, it goes to the archive.org uh, wayback machine yeah. and pulls out all the URLs that it knows about. Um, we'll just so let's just pick on like example.com. Um, to make that a little bit faster. Yeah. Um, so that's going to give us a whole bunch of URLs back. Mm -hmm. um, and we can pipe them through one file. Um, and 
use all of the different facilities it has. So it yep. can give us all the keys, which is great for building wordless for Param Miner. Yep. The values as well, which are great if you're putting things into like Intruder yep. and building wordless for that. So you want to try a whole different so, thing. It, so if you want to do your fussing, yeah. this is a good way to start because you're also now creating content that are very specific for yep. this uh, program. Absolutely. And, and like I think that's the big difference between this way of working and using just like the stuff that's in tech lists. Yeah. Like I use tech lists all the time. It's great. I yeah. love it. Um, but it can take a lot of time to run through your mega raft. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I don't want to run like a hundred thousand paths when I could do a um, hundred paths that are much more tailored to my target. Like that's my general approach for like approach doing reconnaissance on a target um, or, or any of this kind of work really where I have to go and fetch some data and then like do something with that data. Right? I, it's truly inspirational. Thank you very much, Tom. That, that was Sick. No problem. Uh, man. Anytime. Wow. If anyone of you out there want to get in contact or, or get some more information on Tom, uh, where do they find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm uh, at TomNomNom. I'm on GitHub, TomNomNom. Uh, TomNomNom pretty much everywhere. Yeah. TomNomNom.com. TomNomNom.com. <laughs> cool. Epic. Um, BBAC.